His book in progress, based on long-term fieldwork on the making of a UNESCO World Heritage Site in Salvador, Bahia, is titled The Revolt of the Saints, Memory and Redemption in the Twilight of Brazilian Racial Democracy. Professor Collins has also begun a new ethnographic project on the cultural politics of class as related to white-tailed deer hunting. He's the author of, I'm sure some of you will want to hear more about that. <clears throat> He's the author of numerous scholarly articles and reviews that address questions related to racial politics, nationalism, urbanism, critical theory, gender, and the intersections of anthropology and history. His research has been funded by very many prestigious grants. Sarah Sarzinski is assistant professor in the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies here at NYU. She received her PhD uh, only very recently in history from the University of Maryland in 2008 on history, identity, and the struggle for land in northeastern Brazil, 1955 to 1985. So join me in welcoming our speaker and commentator. Well, good evening, everybody. It, it certainly is wonderful to be here. Um, and I have to thank Tom for his, and, and Raphael for the wonderful invitation, and Sarah for her comments, and all of you for, for, for showing up. Um, the, the people who precede me are quite an eminent bunch. And uh, so I hope I have something to add to this. I hope my paper isn't most boring of them all. Uh, with that in mind, I've added, I know some of you have taken a look at the paper beforehand, so I've added a few things to spice it up and also to explain some things. You may notice I'm hobbling. Well, um, and, I, and that speaks, I think, to the paper, to our dispositions towards history. And uh, the reason I'm hobbling has a lot to do with the picture up there, which is I'm, I'm writing a paper right now called Enjoying Homeland Security. And it's uh, based on my own paddles on the East River, which is sort of my Walden Pond here in New York. And so lately I've been paddling about the East River. I see the authenticity of the canoe right there. And just the other day, I came across these amazing hieroglyphs of some forgotten age. and. I found an A, my wife is Anna, and I found a G, my son is Gabriel, and I found a J, and I'm John. And so I very carefully got out of my canoe and piled them into my canoe and took them, paddled them up the river to take them home. And when I got out of the canoe, the first thing I noticed was that the A was in fact a V covered by seaweed. <laughs> And when I got the J to the front of my house, my dog greeted me. And as my dog greeted me, I swerved. And as I swerved, a 100-pound piece of granite dropped from waist height directly onto my right foot. And so that flash, that, that sort of moment of touching the stone workers who split the quarry, quarried the rocks and placed them somewhere so that they ended up on the side of the East River as apparently dead and incomprehensible uh, hieroglyphics uh, means a lot to me today. It means a lot to me in terms of my corporeal disposition towards the past. And I, I could wax too eloquent and say that I begin to understand the, the travails of the workers in a, the Victorian age. But that would be a lie. Um, I don't understand it, but I am trying to understand uh, how it is that people in a variety of moments relate to this thing we call history, which we are fairly good at substantiating and rendering truthful oftentimes, and making work in a variety of political programs. Um, clearly, my paper is, speaks to Walter Benjamin's work but I would say that rather than hashish in Marseille, it's really Percocet in New York. So with that, if I could begin. <laughs> According to officials in Salvador, capital of the state of Bahia, Brazil's history and the world's cultural heritage faced grave threats in the 1990s. These grave threats were all about the relationships between people and building. People were considered unfit for the buildings. 
people's activities cause the buildings to decay. However, today I don't really want to talk to you about the, the relationship between people and buildings, but I'm more interested in developing a perch from which to engage something slightly different than this tension. Um, I'm interested in what I call, or building on Val Daniel's work, dispositions towards history that have mer emerged in a historical center where the biopolitical management of a population's everyday habits has blurred the boundaries between people and objects. In other words, this paper rests on the claim that people have become a form of patrimony in Brazil in a site which is famous as a center of the, f of the tr slave trade, no less. Um, and that the reason, one of the principal reasons that they have been able to make out what I call their patrimonialization involves the specific techniques that their state uses to try to purify Afro-Brazilian culture, in other words, their everyday habits as something that is amenable to the development projects which are bundled around the revivification or the purification or the resuscitation of a certain culture which gives rise to a formation, of a representation of the origins of Brazil because Brazil is very well known as what's been long called a racial democracy, for example. So it depends upon the country in various ways, in ways that denigrate people's experiences, but it depends upon the certain contributions of indigenous Lusitanian and African people. And Bahia is very much construed as the African pole uh, for tradition and for the African contribution to the nation. And of course, today in Brazil, that's something that's very much up for grabs. So how the, the African contribution and how Afro-Brazilian citizenship is configured is something that's changing radically in Brazil today. Okay. So, in thinking about this relationship between people and buildings, or the blurring of subjects and objects, which I um, uh, uh, set up so far, I'd like to move to statues. And my reasons for, st for, for moving to statues are sort of twofold. One is, is that I, I interpret statues as in fact, a quite interesting hybrid figure between the human and the architectural. Um, it's a specific type of material representation that can be uh, manipulated in a variety of ways, as it typically is in Afro-Brazilian religion. But most of all, it has to do with a particular way that the Bahian novelist Jorge Amado has treated statues. And I'd like to take, actually, I'd like to differ from Amado, but nonetheless build upon his story. But before I begin with Amado, let me begin with the historical background to Amado. On August 27, 1975, in the midst of Brazil's 1964 to 1985 dictatorship, the Supreme Court ruled in a 6 to 5 vote that the military appointed governor of Bahia, Antonio Carlos Magalhães, could send trucks to the city of Recife, capital of the state of Pernambuco, to pick up a collection of 762 religious artworks purchased some two years earlier. Put together by the Pernambucan collector Abelardo Rodriguez, and then sold for three million cruzeros by his heirs, the collection was expropriated by Pernambuco's governor and declared a part of the state's patrimony just six days after its sale to the government of Bahia. But the stratagem failed, and the Bahians, relying on the Supreme Court decision, took possession. Nonetheless, the two-year-long the two contest over icons of Northeastern relig religiosity mobilized the cultural classes from Pernambuco and Bahia. These are the two most important states in this region long characterized and still marked by the seigneurial lords, slavery, and the sugar plantations supplanted national importance by Rio de Janeiro's coffee groves in the mid-19th century and then later Sao Paulo in the 1920s. Nonetheless, to this day, Bahia and Pernambuco, the birthplace of, um, well, Pernambuco is sort of the home state of Gilberto Freire, who's typically given credit as the father or the most convincing expositor of Brazil's myth of racial democracy or its myth of uh, an abiding hybridity that makes up for a perceived originary lack that speaks to metropolitan modernity and that unites the nation in an ostensibly non-racialist manner. Um, so possession of the Abelardo Rodriguez collection was thus a significant gain on many levels for the governor of Bahia, Antonio Carlos Magalhães, an astute populist 
who would leverage his connections to the military into an appointment as Brazil's Mil Minister of Communications under José Sarney, Sarney, the first civilian president to take office following the dictatorship. This proved a powerful base for Magalhães, who ended up be being a federal senator from Bahia three times, mayor of Salvador, Salvador is the capital of Bahia, three times, federal minister of communications, uh, city councilman a number of times, and governor of the state of Bahia three times. Today, the Abelardo Rodriguez collection is housed in its own museum on Rua Gregorio de Matos, at the center of the Pelerino Historical Center, which is the downtown colonial center of the city of Salvador, which in 1984 was declared a part of Brazil's national patrimony, in 1985 part of UNESCO World Patrimony, and in 1992 underwent a massive reconstruction, which is still going on today, which is designed to turn what was a red light district into a gleaming representation of national origins, which tie tightly into these racial uh, ideologies, which I'm talking to you about right now. So despite the centrality of the Abelardo Rodriguez Museum, few people seem to visit it. Yet this lack of popularity does not take away from the fact that the Baroque art and architecture are powerful signs of post-colonial authority in Brazil today. An example of the role of the Baroque in Northeastern inventions of tradition is Abelardo Rodriguez's description of his collection as, and I'm quoting, that which remains, of course that which remains is a in great interest of mine today, and therefore offers a vision of a luxurious empire which possessed an incredibly rich imaginary and blossomed at a historical juncture at which gold, precious stones, cotton, sugar, and coffee made possible the rise of this Baroque so impregnated with religious spirit. This issue of spirit, religious spirit, and material icons will become increasingly important to my argument today. I, hi I highlight also the relationship enunciated by Rodriguez between a plantation and mining-based economy and the cultural or religious-based examples of material culture it, configured as spawn it is configured as spawning or underwriting. From such a perspective, the export of commodities generates a realm of material possessions lifted out of the market by the private collector a man who represents precisely the social group that benefited most from and arose in direct relationship to Pernambuco's and Bahia's colonial slave-based economies. In other words, the collection points to both epical rupture and historical continuity, something the heart of both cultural heritage and the sort of engagement and the sort of argument I have begun above about the enduring influence and the reanimation of certain concerns about degeneracy and regeneration as enacted in the space between people and buildings in the great, former great, formerly great colonial mansions of the Pelerino. The transshipment to Bahia of Rodriguez's artworks, formerly housed in his mansion in Recife's most elegant neighborhood, seems to reveal a certain expansion of the state's reach under the military. The very act of collecting by an individual like Rodriguez reveals an interest in the afterlives of objects in enduring significance that cannot be reduced to exchange value or even the use values ascribed to religious icons by Roman or Brazilian folk Catholic congregations. Yet the state of Bahia's purchase of the collection suggests a movement to take control of the nostalgic exhibition, and thus the nationalization of objects formerly privatized by seigneurial families. As revealed by the state of Pernambuco's defensive yet tardy expropriation, such redefinitions of ownership require specific property regimes codified in law, in the Rodriguez case, state and national laws governing public patrimony, or what is usually called cultural heritage in the Anglophone world, regulate art objects as collective possessions of the community, or in the case of UNESCO, all humankind. But such theorizations and instantiations of property involve more than simple possessions. They point to authorize and authorize a symbolic construction of a regional sovereignty around a possession made visible through its potential for exhibition in semi-public state-regulated space called the museum or heritage zone. This is a point made by a variety of commentators, and one that is usually understood in relation to symbolic death or the sapping of vitality under capitalism known as reification. Now, arguments about reification, musealization, fetishization, and thus a radical in inauthenticity characterized by impoverished or narial parochial symbolic symbols associated with the museum plague the specialized literature on patrimony. Elsewhere, I have suggested that that which appears inauthentic in the Pellerino as an exhibitionary complex is in fact nat naturalized quite quickly, and hence these discussions of inauthenticity make little 
since. Yet today I would like to emphasize a different facet of heritage's mobility, and hence its role in democratic politics produced on, around historical reconstruction. Property is a key component of modern personhood. Belonging is an essential aspect of liberal democratic theory, and a concern with self-possession is salient in this work, of, in, expressed by political theorists from John Locke to C.B. McPherson's theory of possessive individualism. It's this scarcely concealed linkage between belonging belongings and politics, and thus between heritage, subjectivity, and history, on which I concentrate in a relatively iconoclastic manner today. And I use the word iconoclasm to emphasize my engagement with objects, and thus a methodological approach that seeks to go beyond a concern with representation, or the Foucauldian-inspired taxonomy so important to recent social scientific work on power and identities. It's thus worth looking at what happened to the Abelardo Rodriguez collection in a specific type of representation or mobilization, namely the War of the Saints, the barely fictional chronicle of Bahian everyday life produced by Jorge Amado in 1987. In 1987, Jorge Amado, drawing on the experiences of his school classmate and friend, Antonio Carlos Magallanes, uh, began to write about the transfer of statues. The novel opens with an account of the transportation of a hip, by a hip young priest and a young nun of a colonial statue of St. Barbara, or the goddess of thunder and lust known in the Afro-Brazilian candomblé as Yansin. On the eve of, of an important ex exhibition at Bahia's Museum of Art, the saint traveled from the plantation town of Santo Amado da Purificação across the Bay of All Saints to the city of Salvador. Upon arriving on the docks of the state capital's lower city, with his, and I'm quoting Amado, with a sway of her hips, St. Barbara of the Thunder slipped between Master Manuel and Maria Clara, the shipmates, and gave them a, a smile of complicity and affection, then held her hands open before her breasts in a ritual gesture. When she passed by the priest and the nun, she waved politely to the nun and winked at the priest. Off went St. Barbara of the Thunder. Yansan had disappeared into the midst of her people. So Amado's description reveals an exoticism characteristic of his work, sort of a location of truth amongst Afro-Brazilian people. Yet, what's important to me here is that in coming into the spirit, into spirit, this is what's happened, she's been possessed by spirit, and that spirit is in fact, Hegel's spirit is in fact my goal in this paper. In coming into spirit, the statue of St. Barbara symbolizes not directly, but orthogonally, by means of a slippage from the Catholic Saint Barbara to the African goddess Iansan, so important to Candomblé. Here it's worth pointing out that movement from representation, from a semiosis that grants meaning through a standing in place of the object represented, to performing with or alongside, is important for my argument about mimesis and history. But for the moment I stress simply that the saint which comes alive on Bahia's docks to Amado's appropriative uh, points to Amado's appropriate engagement with a Bahian peoplehood conflated with its cultural manifestations as represented by the city's intellectuals. This process of elite appropriation of vernacular Bahian is so much a part of uh, nationalism since the 1920s at least gained steam in the decades after World War II and reached its current high point in the Pelerino Restoration, an urban reform ostensibly directed at the protection and restoration of Bahian cultural manifestations. Now, Amado's approach to popular culture might, in a manner related to, yet somewhat different from today's alienations of afro bahian culture as commodified products in a Pelerino-centered marketplace for multicultural difference, what Charles Hale, related to what Charles Hale calls a neoliberal multiculturalism, this might be described as a fetishization. Yet the fetish, a, first, a term first popularized by Portuguese traders confused by local manipulations of objects during early modern voyages to African coasts, is today not solely a misidentification generated by a marketplace-driven way of, a marketplace-driven waylaying of the real sources of value. It's also a moral claim, and moral claims will be very important to this paper. It's also a moral claim about the correct attunement of people and things, and thus the delineation and appropriate treatment of objects and subjects, and the material and spiritual. Here, social theory overlaps with Salvador's history in that if one enters the Bahian Secretary of Public Safety's archive, one discovers fetish object after fetish object, all seized by police authorities who sought to prohibit the practice of Afro-Brazilian condomblé well into the late 20th century. These objects, 
provoked in Bayin elite's great disgust, scaring the rich as well as the poor through their recontextualizing accretions of everyday objects and unexpected juxtapositions of nail clippings, metals, feathers, hair, and blood in a talismanic manner. Now, Kandelblay's objects work powerfully and most basically, or often and generally, through sympathetic magic. As in Haitian Vodun, for which Joan Diane has pointed out that, and I'm quoting her, dispossession accomplished, accomplished by slavery became the model for possession in Vodou, for making a man not into a, th not into a thing, but a spirit. So, in Kandelblay, saints are called up through their colors, their favorite foods, and through representations of elements or materials associated with their myths or physical being. Such associations are not primarily arbitrary in a Saussurian sense, but relatively more iconic or indexical in that the sympathy functions through mimesis and thus upon the ground of texture, contiguity, resemblance, and quality. Now, I'm not arguing this is not a form of representation. It doesn't require some sort of arbitrary jump, but it's relatively closer than is the Caesarean idea about semiosis. In fact, in Amado's telling, the St. Barbara who came alive on the docks in order to go AWOL from a high cultural museum ex exhibition set off, across, set off on a mission to resolve a young woman's romantic setbacks. Thus desire, an anti-Cartesian force that overwhelms and synthesizes to promise conviviality or unification but which becomes most easily representable only in relation to its frustration by outside strictures or failure through lack of reciprocation, is perhaps the most appropriate or apparently natural motivator of an insan who manifests herself in a recontextualized Catholic icon on Salvador's waterfront. So what I'm saying is that for Amado, the manifestation of the saint is dependent upon spirit or is dependent upon a desired base synthesis, right? Thesis, antithesis, a Hegelian movement towards spirit. While Amado's writings locate productive or consummated longing in sexual energy and by his lower classes, and thus, um, thus amongst his black population, desire is, of course, basic to Christianity and its global correlate, universal history. So my big point here is universal history. How are we going to think universal history, which is so much a part of global heritage, right? But how do we do that without spirit? This is important to a cultural heritage that depends quite basically on a Christian, but not necessarily condemnation, secular sacralization that turns on a walling off of objects from their quotidian contexts. Here it's significant that heritage becomes allied with global history and its reliance on common guidelines for the identification and preservation of select objects thought to illustrate shared values and ongoing connections alongside an acceptable in thus carefully regulated range of difference or particularity. Such synthesis, desire, and recontextualization so, recontextualization so basic to the production of shared, <clears throat> of shared or universal history in the Pellerino recall Susan Buck's interest in Hegel and Haiti, and thus in the occlusion so much a part of modern remembering. And at the center, or perhaps the apex, of modern historiography lies the spirit which passes as global history. Now, Ian Saint's eruption, which gives life to a statue in Bahia's harbor in a process that recalls the tensions between slaves and statues that watch over Alejo Carpentier's kingdom of this world, and thus concerns with objects, agency, and freedom in a broader post-emancipation Atlantic, is indebted to in Amado's telling to the spirit possession so much of Candomblé. Such spirit, as underscored, underscored by invocation of Hegel and even Buck's, Buck Morse reworking of Hegel, appears essential to a movement into or modern theorization of the universal history so closely related to cultural heritage. But again, might one tell a different story about history? Might Condomblé's spirit's animation of putatively Roman Catholic forms help reconceptualize the shared culture and common origins displayed in the Pellerino and its arrays of expressive cultural argument, uh, objects? Okay, so I've moved away from, I've moved from statues to their representation in fiction, to discussion of Hegel. And now I'd like to move to the population, okay. to the people who, I've argued, have become aware in the 1990s of their own configuration as a species of lib living patrimony, which is one reason that they are confused with buildings. Right? So we've moved from a tension between people and buildings to some sort of 
conflation of people and buildings within by in patrimony regimes. And I'm not going to read this section to you, but the argument that I that I, that I put forth there is that um, <clears throat> 4,000 people were removed over the over the last 10 years from this neighborhood, and yet it's a neighborhood which is predicated upon Afro-Brazilian vitality for attracting for, for doing everything it does, a variety of things. So there's a certain contradiction here. How do we remain? So what's happened is, is that ethnographers, social scientists, have gone out and collected the practices, which have been very carefully archived, to be re-presented as needed by the Bahian state or by experts like myself in arguments about what Afro-Bahian culture truly is. So my argument here is that this, this great taxonomizing or this great data collection activity, what it's done is it's alerted people to A, the power of social science, B, the moral fundaments of modern social science, and C, the sort of techniques of social science which range from field notes to the archiving that I've talked to you about. So people quite literally see themselves, see their lives being represented by ethnographers, and then they can in fact because they have all sorts of their cousins, or people like myself, have access to the archive, the archivists at IPAC. IPAC was called, for the longest time, was called, um, <clears throat> within the Bahian civil service, was called the, uh, the Institute of the Filhos da Puta, the Institute of Children of, of Sons of Bitches, right? But the, 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 the Institute of Children of Prostitutes, because it hired, tried to hire, during a certain moment, people from the neighborhood and people from the neighborhood were touched by the scourge of prostitution, by the red light zone. So you actually have people who are inside who can report back out to the people who are subject to this, to this, to this social science. You can, they report what's happening to their representations, how they're filtering through government bureaucracy and how they're being redeployed, whether it's for the IDB, for the UN um, delegation that's coming to see whether or not people are being treated correctly. Of course, they're not, right? This is what the UN has and IDB have, have, have agreed upon. But you will become fairly um, adept at understanding how it is that they're being packaged as patrimony, as things, okay? Now, by wrapping Pellerino residents in the ritualized activity of social scientific study and identification, one of the things that they do is, I forgot to say to you, is that um, the way they get people out is by paying them money. And the way that you pay money is by evaluating what somebody needs. Now clearly somebody who is a crackhead or a drug addict doesn't need lots of money, right? Because they'll just blow it. So as a social scientist, you need to sort of evaluate that. I'm, I'm being ironic. Um, as a social scientist, the, the, the state attempts to evaluate this. And uh, uh, on the basis of this evaluation, the people argument about their moral status, they gain more money or less money. So morality becomes incredibly important in an economic sense. So by wrapping people, but it's not, I'm not re reducing this to some sort of, oh, let's, let, let me inhabit culture so I can get money, because there are all sorts of much more, sort of much deeper symbolic things going on, like, for example, people who have never had an ID card or who are, or are illiterate are taken by a social worker, by a middle-class social worker, who they tell me, who smells really good, who wears very nice clothes, and for the first time is taken through government offices given all sorts of attention, right? In some ways, it relates to Joan Biel's work on sort of the attention given to AIDS patients. In fact, I know some of you have read some of my work on kind of what happens in, in, in relation to um, soropositive status. In other words, there are people in the Pellerini who consider that having AIDS, having this, this special essence within them, is in fact something that is desirable because it brings down all sorts of care by the state. So in this paper, what I talk about uh, to, to a large extent, is how this generates a discourse or a reappropriation of the state's discourse, which is called tombamento. Now, tombamento, tomba, um, is a word which has multiple meanings. Um, let, me, let me read to you. Uh, the first time that I realized how rich tombamento is, well, there are, there are a number of, of, of examples, but one, this woman said to me, Esse povo, esse povo doido pra pegar in, uh, she said to me, those people, crazy to receive their identifications, they're the ones that are going to drop dead before they're turned into patrimony. And what they, she said was, 
esse povo doido para pegar a indenização, eles é que vai tombar morto. Those who are tombar, they are going to fall down dead. Tombar. Before they're turned into patrimony, before they're tombado. So the idea here is that you're buried, dead, destructed. When you, when you knock down a building, when you destroy a building, you tomba the building. But you also, when the, Bahian, when, the, when the federal, Brazilian federal state landmarks a building, they also tomba a building. So what people began to do was to appropriate this term tombamento and begin to actually use it as a way of enunciating the kind of ambiguities of becoming a part of Brazilian patrimony. So in one, one sense, they're being objectified. They're, 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 they're losing certain types of subjectivity, which to me is quite important, right? This paper is about sort of the subjects of history, and subjects are supposedly about who is agentive, right? But what I'm arguing to you is that, in fact, objectification becomes agentive for these people. Now, it's not a clearly sort of redemptive, glorious story. It's an ambiguous story. And this is why the, the ambiguities of Tombamento are so important. It's related to Tombamento etymologically comes from the Portuguese National Archive, which is the Torre do Tombo. Um, another possible uh, source of the word is the Latin tumulum, or storehouse, archive. Tumulum, tomb. In either case, the word as employed in Brazil today means to preserve something in the archive. So it's not just landmarking, which I told you. It's also archiving something. And I've told you that people are watching themselves become a part of the great archive from which future histories are produced in Bahia. Evoked in this manner, the verb tombar recalls the word cadaver, or um, derived from the Latin cadere, which, like tombar, means to fall down or be unable to stand on one's own. Thus, the words for patrimonializing and dying demonstrate substantial and practical, etymological and practical overlap. And the care of the everyday needs of the Pelerinus population as configured in the 1990s by IPAC is an attention designed to celebrate, prolong, and commemorate the elision of people in favor of their celebration through representation. In fact, residents claim that Brazil's cradle is not about life for life's sake, but life in dialogue with death. They argue that Pelerinus preserve life in the, preserves life in the service of death suspending them as representations from which the state profits and demonstrates its own efficacy by wrapping its people in the formal signs of care. And according to residents, while this is going on, it prepares and girds their physical remover, removal and memorialization in registries hidden in the bowels of its headquarters. Here, representation and the documentation that supports it become problematic issues in relation to human subjectivity and state power. Yet at the risk of sounding like a purveyor of national or community character studies, this is not exactly a novel development attributable to the Pelerinia reforms alone. For example, it's common in all of working class Bahia, and especially the Pelerinio, to avoid talk about what a person really is like, since one can never know or represent such a thing. Nor can, nor can or should one speak for another person. This inability to represent the truth of a person is in Bahian common sense why one should not trust completely even one's loved ones or one's self since one never knows what one is capable of doing or will do in a given situation. What I'm saying is perhaps best exemplified by um, many, many, it's very common uh, amongst Brazilian men today, working class men, to go to prison and to become a born again Christian because it's the way that you survive in, in, in prison. In prison. Um, when uh, somebody who's left prison and become a born-again Christian is faced with a problem on the street, they'll typically say, So Jesus, only Jesus. What they're saying is that only Jesus is capable of holding me back. Thanks to the grace of Jesus, I am not responding to you. So this is an example of what I'm beginning to set up here, which is that... Um, it's widespread, especially for men, to construct their public and private and personas in relation to a very real capability for violence that's not one's own, but rather something from outside, or something one, that it, not, one cannot help as it rears up and takes hold of or directs one's actions. A similar dynamic is also invoked in relation to sexuality, and especially desire by a heterosexual man for another man 
or infidelity. In both cases, authorship and responsibility, common ideologies typically linked to the truth of representation in post-enlightenment thought, are not considered to be productive of truth by Bayans. In light of prohibitions against knowing or representing the human, the act of researching and writing in a social scientific vein violates a variety of accepted Bayan ways of interacting with others and the world more generally. Such fears were exacerbated during the Pellerino Restoration by the association of money with the textual identification or identification of residents on the basis of social science. Tombamento as employed by Pellerino, by Pellerino residents is thus a resolutely ambiguous positioning, one linked to frowned upon activities, but also in a sense recuperated and resignified slightly as a practice worthwhile to the making do so celebrated by Bahia's black population. And for those of you who read the paper, there's an early part where we talk about how, the, how um, every, everyday abilities to um, survive where it seems impossible to survive is sort of the very beginning of modernist uh, uh, celebration of everyday life in this neighborhood. So the next section of the paper tells a story of a man who uh, looks, what happens is that the documents about his life are forgotten by the social worker and the social scientists who are interviewing people in his building. And what he essentially does is to sequester the documents, to kidnap the documents. Uh, this is a ledger which describes the lives of people so that the government can put, can put a price upon their removal. So when the social worker leaves, she sends back her assistant to come and look for these documents. And this man, who I call Malachias, says, well, are you sure, you know, are you sure she really needs her documents? Are you sure they're really important? And when the intern says yes, he says, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, you tell Dona Carla that I'm going to go visit my mother tonight. He lies. He says he hid them out in his mother's house for safekeeping. And he says, if you give me money, I'll return them to you. Now, again, I've said to you that, that this, is a, this is a commodified exchange, that money is very important. But there's a, there's a whole lot more going on here than some sort of um, rational attempt to, 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 uh, to profit from the reforms. Um, and I think that an example of this is the man says, as soon as the intern steps out, he turned to the rest of us and says, yeah, if I were to go, I would take the bus and it would cost me a one real 40 total. They say they're the patrimony. Well, I'm patrimony. I'm the one who's folkloric. They want to put me in their questionnaires and put me up there. Big black guy from the Pellerino, well, those milk toasts, bunda mole, as he called them, are going to put me up there, are, are going to get, pay me what I deserve. I do my own research. I have my own dossier. I know what they're trying to do. At the same time, one of his neighbors added, hey, Malachias, don't forget to include in that dossier left-handed, toothless, and a stutterer. So there's a lot to say about Malachias, his friends, and the ruined colonial building. In fact, this is the ruined colonial building. This is one of his friends. This man, in fact, is the number one student in geography right now at the Federal University of Bahia, um, a living example of how affirmative action programs just put into play in Brazil. I said that, that racial, racial politics are, are in flux right now. Um, he, he, he's somebody who was accepted through affirmative action programs and is now the very best student. But at the time, he was living in this building here. Um, the point here that I'm trying to make is one of an, uh, of an ongoing ruination, right? So it's an engagement with ruination. If you look at uh, the work we it's, it's very common to talk about disposable peoples today, to talk about the, the, the peripheries of cities, um, to talk about people as objects. And I think I'm trying to say something quite different, which is that there's a certain, I'm not valorizing poverty. I'm not valorizing garbage. I'm not valorizing the, the margins, as we see happening in, in social science right now. But what I'm doing is I'm looking at people who are at the very center of the representation of colonial Brazil and are at the very center of the operations that put together and purify this Brazil, and become aware of that. And in doing so, in relation to long-standing ideologies or long-standing cultural symbols or cultural practices in Bahia, begin to reconfigure or begin to allow, to help me to rethink 
the relationships between subjects and objects. Because again, one of the important sort of theoretical backgrounds to this is recent work by Webb Keen, who talks about um, kind of the importance of subjectivity to agency, right? So I said to you that fetishization, for example, is a, is a moral claim. Um, when you think about the, the fetish for Marx, uh, fetishization is bad, clearly, right? It's about a, a world of appearances in which the market screws up where value really comes from and leads to kind of a hall of mirrors, all sorts of things like false consciousness. Now, this is, might be true, right? A brilliant analysis. But it is a moral claim which is dependent upon the separation of subjects and objects. Something similar, it's related to Hegel. It's related to universal history. It's related to certain movements in Christianity and hence the, the, the fetish, right? So the way that Christianity purifies itself from problematic religions like Candomblé is by mapping out the separation between subjects and objects and by treating objects correctly. And the reason that I gave you Georges Amado's work is that Amado, in, that's actually kind of an interesting fictional work based on the recent history of Bahia, but Amado continues a very Christian vein. And to a certain extent, I, I quoted Joan Diane there for you, right? Joan Diane says that the objectification of, basically I'm paraphrasing, says that the, the objectification of slavery is made up for by the spirit possession of Candomblé. I'm not sure that's true. I'd like to re re rethink that. So it's significant that given Mal what Mal Malachias says about his own deformities, his own problems, and his own patrimonialization, his physical defects, his ruinous person, it's significant that not after, long after I talked to him, I visited a man named Bulindo, a 40-something mid-level drug dealer who lived in a nearby building. Bulindo and Malachias were long-term parceros or partners due in no small part to the fact that they had both been locked up together as minors in the infamous Pedra Preta, which is Salvador's antiquated prison. It's now been replaced by a, a, modern, a more modern penitentiary. During our meeting, Bolindo received a visitor. A man jumped in as we were talking. And the man brought him a threatening letter from pr a prison inmate with whom he was involved in a dispute. And he picked up the letter, looked at me, and said, this one's for the archive. This one's for the dossier. At that moment, he slipped the paper into a plastic binder of the type carried by EPOC social scientists and construction foremen. And he said to me, I want this in case something happens to that boy. He then stated, in answer to a question about the difference between the Pelerino and the peripheral working class neighborhoods to which people were being pushed out during this, this late 90s moment, he said, here there are no taboos. Here a guy wants to be gay. He comes out when he's 12 and starts living with an old guy, some 50-year-old fart. In the neighborhood, it's at age 18, 20, and the kid still has to study, graduate, get a job so he can build his own space, his place for winning his independence. Here, a person, when he is born, is born into a powerful disgrace. Back in the days, so a powerful disgrace is a source of power. Back in the days when the Maciel, Maciel is what you called the Pelerino before its reconstruction. Back in the days when the Maciel was the Maciel, you had thieves' wives screwing policemen, the same thieves hooking up with their prostitute neighbors, damn stool pigeons taking it from behind from drug dealers, pickpockets fooling around with shoplifters, and a bunch of sweet-talking middle-class bohemians on weekends. That was some life, the Maciel. Again, like Malachia's statement, Bolindo's words are quite rich and warrant greater attention than I can give them here. Nonetheless, I deploy them simply to emphasize the extent to which the Pelerino population, the Maciel, is configured and configures itself as disgraced, polluted, or ruined. This symbolic ruination becomes a source of pride. Such a resignification of degeneracy has long been a part of a national tradition in which esperteza, wiliness, or malandragem, trickster-like bearing, expresses a core value of a Brazil understood as defined by its exceptional deviation from more established or apparently static and thus more metropolitan ways of doing things, becoming a community, or engaging capitalism. Such degeneracy holds out a future possibility and hence still unre unrealized movement into redemption or a cleansing or reconstruction like that performed by Epoch on the Pelerino population and architectural wonders. Yet Bolindo defers such redemption, instead wallowing in the possibilities for expression and self-becoming offered by the swirling milieu of a red light zone characterized by a freedom dependent on disgrace, 
or relations of domination and thinly veiled sexual violence. He does so while brandishing a piece of potential evidence held in reserve in case something happens to that boy. History from Malakias and Bulindo, as well as most of their neighbors, is not about reconfiguring evidence so as to interpret it differently. Rather, history for the both is primarily, primarily proleptic, unrealized, and little more than a potential, albeit one that is important to maintain as open and as open as possible. Um, Entering or altering history, then, is about waiting and maintaining evidence and one's positioning so as to slip into and take advantage of future developments. This is not to say that evidence will not be deployed or that interpretation is not a part of the engagements with scraps of paper and folders of documents that constitutes the historical practices of residents awaiting identification or challenging expulsion orders. But it is to argue that a deferral and hence a valorization of signs in the present that might someday constitute archives uh, for writing or performing histories is preeminent in a Pelerino and a population constituted through tombamento. And given this emphasis on deferral, on potentiality, historical evidence is not limited to the contents of writing, but rather to the manipulation, as Malachias demonstrates, of material signs of the possession of evidence. So these are all just pictures to give you some idea of the runes and the buildings in which people are living. You can see the modern Salvador below the ruins here. That's the lower city from which the, dock, the statue of St. Barbara took off. And here, I wanted to show you this picture here. This is what I was just talking to you about, is that it's part of this proleptic history. That, again, the contents of historical documents are not important. Interpretation is not important. Manipulation is important. So here what you have is, this is a building called the ghetto. And the people, the three people on the left are, the two people on the left are, are EPOC teams. Sort of very white man, the black man behind him. The people on the right are Pelerino residents who are coming to meet them. And all three of those men um, are illiterate. They can't read. And if you look under their arms, they're carrying these pastas, the dossiers that have been referred to multiple times in this talk. And here's an example of how these, these shreds of paper are carted about, not again, not for interpretation, but as part of people who are claiming on the basis of their ability to manipulate shreds of paper that they themselves are objects of patrimony. So the spaces between scraps of paper, sociological studies in preparation for an urban reform, historical archives, and their potential, re their potential deployment recalls Walter Benjamin's arcades project, Scrapbooks, as well as enigmatic montages and emphasis on iconicity and connection. Benjamin's notes contain several clippings related to the sorts of appropriations of buildings and land at play in the late 20th century Pelerino. According to the fragment Benjamin extracted from volume six of, du six of Ducamp's Paris, I'm quoting here what Benjamin had in his notebooks, he says, a new industry was created which, on the pretext of taking in hand the interests of the expropriated, did not shrink from the basest fraud. It sought out small manufacturers and equipped them with detailed account books, false inventories, and fake merchandise that often was nothing more than logs wrapped in paper. It would even pr procure groups of customers to fill the shop on the day that the jury made their that their prescribed visit. It fabricated leases, exaggerated, extended, antedated, on sheets of old paper bearing official stamps. So we actually see something very similar happening, happening during, uh, the, uh, during the Hausmanization of 19th century Paris. Um, these, so Parisians seem to have engaged in similar subterfuges to the ones that Pellerino residents are doing to increase their identifications. So to get your identification higher, you don't just argue that you're moral. You argue that you have a family of 12, and you sign your mother who lives somewhere else, your cousin up. You increase these ledgers, and then you receive identifications from the additional family members. But there's something different in that Unlike the Parisians, they're not relying on barristers. They're not relying on a, a mediating um, <clears throat> level of experts, of lawyers, who do this for the storekeepers. Pellerino residents, what they're doing is deploying themselves. They are themselves engaging in this same sort of, uh, of um, tricking of the state in order to inflate their identifications that be interest Benjamin in terms of the Parisian reforms that give rise to his arcades projects. 
So I would suggest to you that the resultant invention of a life or fabrication of leases, stores, and especially in Bahia, moral stances, phantasms, they're called phantasms is the word given to people that are made up to inflate identifications, and kin who are supposedly living with us, these, these processes which are put together to inflate identification seem a more direct, unmediated engagement with both professional knowledge and knowledge of the self. And again, most of my paper is about knowledge of the self and its relationship to knowledge, to professional knowledge in the present, which calls up history as a retrospective glance and as a forward-looking glance in a variety of ways. Now, it's not really... I have to admit something else. I, I, I was once an, a Roman Catholic altar boy in my youth. And it's not simply my past as a Catholic altar boy that makes me want to talk about saints and not angels. But Christianity and its concerns with moral selves and the cultivation of sacred objects um, are a motivating force for my paper today. And Christianity has much to do with my title, Saints, Not Angels. So let me put these things slightly differently. The ra rather strange uses of patrimony and patrimonialization by both residents of the Pellerino and the Bahian state directs me to Walter Benjamin's Angel of the Ninth Thesis on the Philosophy of History. This angel, and I'm quoting Benjamin, would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. But instead, the angel faces a violent storm called progress, which, and I'm quoting again, is, which irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. I suspect that the claim to an ontological status akin to the nation's architectural and folkloric manifestations put forth by those living human symbols of national origins patrimonialized in today's Pellerino may help resituate or at, v at very least complicate, a vision of history as produced in relation to runes made out fleetingly by an angel's vision is delimited by a storm called progress. There's little doubt that a storm called progress, in this case a future seemingly guaranteed by the packaging and reconstitution of visible signs of the past, has rolled through the Pellerino. Since 1992, over 4,000 people have been removed, miles and miles of, pa of, of files filled with data have been produced, and a gleaming historical center has taken shape among the over 500 ruined colonial buildings restored in the $100 million program. What this storm reveals, I began to suggest above, involves the potential to make out a world of and in ruins. To begin this making out of a new history, I invoke again the specter of Hegel and universal history alongside Joan Dion's relatively canonical and extremely insightful commentary on Haitian loas, or Afro-related or, or, or Afro deities akin to Bahia's Orishas. And Orishas are the spirits who inhabit the saint. Right? They come down. So I'm going to repeat. Diane argues that the dispossession accomplished by slavery becomes the model for possession in voodoo, for making a man not into a thing, but into a spirit. But what exactly does it mean to become such a spirit, and to do so in a self-consciously historical landscape littered with bones, bodies, and money? Is the spirit of maximum synthesis and world historical achievement that lies, impossibly, at the end of Hegel's cascading dialectic really what we're looking for? In a recent ethnography of Bayen Candomblé, Roger Sancy argues that making the saint, which is what Diane is talking about, Diane is talking about, is a very concrete material process. It is not exactly a religious revelation or conversion, nor a schooling of the myth, songs, and prayers but it is essentially about learning to deal with the saint, understand its requirements, and fulfill them satisfactorily. So becoming a member of Candomblé, Sansi is arguing, is not about simply about receiving the saint, but it's about a process of turning one's body into a vessel, a very material vessel, that attracts the saint. And I said to you before that it attracts the saints on the basis of color, texture, food, right? So Candomblé is not like the Catholicism with which African practice entered in dialogue as slaves were transferred to Brazil, a religion based on belief or individual volition, choice, or sovereignty. Rather, it is in many ways an engagement with affliction and necessity. One does not, according to the most influential of Bahia's priestesses, 
who will sometimes nonetheless induct a powerful initiative in a truncated ceremony. One does not, um, it's not a practice in which practitioners seek out a temple because they want to, but because they must. In other words, spirits, so-called spirits, invade our bodies because they can, and there is little that their human vessels can do besides seek out a priestess and learn to engage with, and thus learn from and propitiate the gods who invade our interiority. Put simply then, what if the angel of history is not an angel, but a saint? Here for those of you who are not formal altar, bo altar boys, it's worth pointing out that the major differences between saints and angels in Catholic theology is that angels are purely spiritual beings. Meanwhile, saints are deceased humans and thus necessarily fallen beings who lived on earth and were thus manifested in material form, like the objects through which they are venerated and cultivated at some point in time. This, I suggest, constitution of body and mind, object and subject, and matter and spirit worthy of and perhaps challenging to Hegel. In his work on French rocket bases in Guyane, Peter Redfield has suggested that storms of progress blow, but the angels of history no longer fly in a single line. But I'm putting forth something different than his epical argument about technology. What if the subject or mediator of history is not the gazing angel, but the detritus against which narrative takes place? In other words, the pile of debris accumulating before the angel's face as the angel is pushed back by the storm of progress. Such a question sounds, I have to say, I have to, I'm embarrassed as I put this to you, because such a question sounds much too much like a naive attempt at some history from below, or an attempt to rescue something from that cliché dustbin of history. In other words, if we can only get down with the most oppressed, we'll really understand history. This is not the argument I'm trying to make. I've not presented Pellerino residents as remainders, leftovers, forgotten, or somehow outside movement central to powerful currents and accepted global histories, and thus a UNESCO World Heritage Site. They are simply, as Malachias Bolindo and the chorus that is their neighbors tell us, part of Brazil's patrimony due to their disgrace and their defects or disabilities. And of course, disgrace, defect, and disability implies also the possibility of redemption, but not its realization. We're close to Hegel and universal spirit, but I'm trying to get away from Hegel and spirit and synthesis. I'm thus looking at the debris at the angel's feet in a manner inspired by people whose engagement with modernity leads them to, to argue that they are common community possessions or objects, and this objectivity or objectness empowers them and carries with them an important tie to runes and degradation. Like most powerful stories about a nation called Brazil, which, and I'm quoting here one of the most eminent, Roberto Schwartz, one of the most eminent crit crit critics, cultural critics in Brazil. Um, like the most powerful stories about a nation called Brazil, which, in, and I'm quoting, reproducing its social order, unceasingly affirms and reaffirms Euro European ideas, always improperly. Malachias and Bolinda gesture at and define themselves around an already ruined, already deformed state that is also a patrimonialized condition. This conforms to acceptable discourse in a Pellerino where the Bayan insult, gente ruim, or bad people, is in fact a compliment. It is also common for residents to refer to themselves with great pride as gente torta, twisted, deformed people, whose paths have diverged from bourgeois and working class norms, thus turning them into a celebrated population and icons of a national belonging predicated on the celebration of difference. To make this point is not to accept at face value Brazilian claims about hybridity, tropical creativity, and difference from metropolitan norms. But it is to take seriously the power of ideology, and thus the convincing nature of stories, practices that make the community real. Proper historicity, as I have begun to develop the concept here, is thus all about impropriety. It is about a certain negative dialectics, a turning against alongside a wallowing in the conventions of a bourgeois propriety constituted in Bahia in contradistinction to the Pellerino's storied yet stigmatized populace, that in lying in ruins stands at the historical origins of the nation? While such origins need to be purified so they can be represented, representation necessarily involves a stripping away of certain associations and a proliferation of new ties, it seems that both Malachias and Bulindo are content to carry with them or sequester signs that they are unable to interpret and thus to present and, un and thus unable to represent in a finished archive or narrative. 
Walter Benjamin's memory work depends on recognizing and nurturing the materiality of signs as well as the juxtaposition of ox objects in an attempt to seize dialectal images that rise up unexpectedly. I began with this, with the hieroglyphic stones that caused me to curse and in my pain I felt the pain of the Victorian workers. So Benjamin is all about pushing these signs so that you get a, a flash. While such a possibility intrigues me, I'm not convinced by it. Instead, I want to make seriously what I have put forth above, and thus to an extent deny spirit or flashes by concentrating not on synthesis, but on the sorts of hard work and materializations that make Condomble a religion of materiality rather than apparitions. In other words, what is most important about spirit possession in Bahia is not necessarily the spirit, but the hard work, the place, and the objects that call down a spirit through sympathetic attraction realized by practitioners setting out of an Orisha's favorite colors, foods, emblems, clothing, and tool. So let me begin to conclude. The ethnography in the pages above depicts a Pelerino population which rejects the synthesis of spirit and history, and which becomes instead the objects of history. People do so by posing, positing overlaps and conveyances between humans and buildings and claiming a powerful disgrace. This has occurred as residents work to seize hold of a discourse of patrimonialization so as to argue that they are authentic, living possessions of the nation that exists in a type of post-human afterlife that grants them special powers in that nation. At several points today, I have alluded to this engagement with social science's role in producing an array of modern properties, a process I have described elsewhere as canonization and beatification, whereby residents become a type of sacred ancestor to and possession of the nation. Such canonization involves entering into the ledgers the research programs, and thus the evaluation of a populace by the state in such a way that the tools wielded to exclude and subject come instead to constitute an asento, or a place akin to the space in which an orisha is cultivated so that it becomes one with initiate in candomblé. Yet in making such an argument, my ethnography may come dangerously close to levi strauss description in Tris Tropiques of the naive uses of writing by Nambiquara. It might thus mimic a traditional ethnology and a folkloric celebration of difference that proposes an exotic outside akin to Amado's popular culture, which anthropologists discover so as to destabilize our inside. Yet I'm attempting something different. I'm describing a group of people who have come so close, so absolutely close to social science, and thus so close to the aforementioned search for and construction of difference, that they are able to push up and touch in sympathy with this discourse so as to constitute themselves sensuously and quite carefully as nearly a part of it. In other words, people like Bolindo and Malakias are indeed Genshi Huin and Genshi Torta, twisted and bad people. They're close friends of mine, so I'm not saying bad. And... But as such, and in light of the salience of a cultural heritage-based emphasis on recuperation, they become powerful and a part of treasured, a treasured set of objects granted enormous attention and a special space by the national and international community. Within this objectification, they become a species of subject, for lack of a better word, set off from the everyday. Yet they cannot be angels, since angels do not go to a jail called the Pedra Preta. Angels have no form, and angels soar high above the mounds of trash and fetid ruins in which both men, both of them, by the way, are former street children who raised themselves in the Pelerino, so angels soar high above these fetid ruins through in which both men have made a life which empowers them in ways typically unavailable to working class Bahians without access to the Pelerino. Instead, they are, while people, like scraps of paper awaiting incorporation in the archive or narrativization by historians. As potentials, they must align themselves so as to remain poised for a narrativization that they must also resist. So this is not an idea of an object as an inert object, as a thing that crushes your foot or just sits there. Let me just say that behind this is uh, one of the most essential uh, ideologies of Brazilian national life is the idea that one does not sit still, that one is con in constant motion. And the best example I've ever had of this is that once a man looked at me and said, uh, he looked at me and he said, um, you know, John, there are many positions that, children, that the children of Jesus Christ take, but the best position of all is to take no position at all. 
This is, this is I think, I, I don't want to make an argument to you about an, uh, an enduring national culture. I'm making to you an argument about reanimation and recreation and ongoing negotiations between a state bureaucracy which oversees the everyday life of people and how that loops back into the everyday life of those people. But there is uh, a picking up and a reinterpretation of long-standing narratives of Brazilian unity in that. And they're about prolepsis, in other words, putting off, not taking a position, about manipulation, about the power of, well, I'm adding the part about the power of runes. In thinking about the implications of such a proleptic and potential history, I move back one more time, and I pray for the last time, to Catholic theology. For Benjamin, the angel of history supposedly blown away from the pile of debris before him, is transported with his back to the future, gazing impossibly at increasingly obscured remnants now related to the past. But according to Matthew 18.10, Jesus Christ alleges that the angels in heaven always look upon the face of my heavenly Father. So when we think about the image of the, the, the angel, rather than looking at the face of the heavenly Father, the angel is looking at the pile of junk. Thus the angel of history is clearly not in heaven, and a pile of detritus has replaced the, fa the face of the Lord in a fallen age. This would seem a fitting metaphor for heritage as a secular sacred, or a procession of spoils and detritus whose reconstruction in places like the Pellerino in effect memorializes a once ruined state as a condition of possibility for progress, and thus establishes the tradition that stands in for an absent God, no longer to able to grant salvation or to open the gates of heaven. But if God is gone, and runes mark the passage of time, and thus the flight of angels, and the progress of humanity, why must the backward-facing glance of a disembodied messenger remain the vantage point of history? Why not the carefully materialized body of a saint? In Brazil, the Roman Catholic saint functions as a being or cipher which serves as a raw material of redemption while on earth, a member of the predilect after death and canonization, an image for emulation and requests by the faithful, and thus a nearly human companion when God seems far away. According to ethnographers like Jose Bastide, the Brazilian cult of the saints was a result of a scarcity of churches and priests. This gave rise to a Catholicism often linked to Candomblé scathingly denounced as idolatry by Brazil's burgeoning evangelical Christian community today. This debauched Catholicism produced a set of figures actively manipulated by the faithful. After all, in a tradition dating to medieval Iberia, those unsuccessful in love would often remove the child in the arms of uh, household statues of St. Anthony so as to punish the saint and induce him to aid the lovelorn supplicant. So, saint statues stood like powerful fetishes on the cusp of humanity and sanctity materiality and ephemerality, and sin and salvation. Today, in a city famed for carnival and sexuality, but which borders the Bay of All Saints and is populated by an overwhelmingly black population of people who often carry surnames linked to slavery, the Middle Passage, and forced convention, forced conversion. These sur surnames are dos santos, of the saints, purificação, purification, concessão, the, the immaculate con conception. Um, Asunção, the Assumption. So, in the city famed for carnival and sexuality, bordering the Bay of All Saints, filled with people called saints actively, it seems important to develop a history that would not substitute one story for another different story through a better interpretation. Rather, it would seem necessary to recognize the impossibility of spirit and the ineffability of angels. All that remains for us are saints, however sad and besmirched they may be. Thank you. Right. Wow. Thank you so much for this great paper, and I'm going to try to throw out a few other things here to think about and, and contextualizing some of that and, and some of the approaches that I took to it when I read it. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the, the violence of the displacement by the state and the municipal governments um, that accompanied the, designi the designation of Salvador as a UNESCO cultural heritage site and people's reactions to these displacements using the tools that they've seen 
in this process to sort of recon in the process to reconstruct Pueblo Riño as a UNESCO cultural heritage site, um, and also how they've used those to justify or to try to justify their right and their place within the community itself. <coughs> um, so in, in thinking about this, I'm just going to raise a couple of different issues that, I, that I've been thinking about. Um, so one of these has to do with, um, in part, the sources that you're using and how your focus is on individuals. And I'm wondering whether these individuals are part of larger social networks. Um, whether it's something like the Saint Tetu or other other types of the the Brazilian homeless um, movement or other types of movements, and I think um, I, in in this I'm drawing from recent work about the Quilombo movements as well, um, and also the existence of powerful groups such as Oludum in in Bahia, which I know you've written about, um, but how they negotiated with the state government to become a part of Bahian uh, cultural patrimony and, and representative of that, and how these particular individuals interact with those social networks that are ex in existence. Um, are they excluded from these community networks, uh, or are they choosing not to align with themselves with these networks for one reason or another? And, uh, and on this, too, I'm drawing from um, Jen Hoffman's French recent work, uh, Legalizing Identities, about uh, the conflicts between a Quilombo community and indigenous community in Alagoas, in a northeastern state, and how these, both of these communities pulled from historical legacies and narratives and proof of their history in order to justify the right to stay on their land and to, st and to create a legal right to their identity as being a part of that territory and that space. Um, so I guess in that, I'm wondering if this, at, how this compares, if at all, to the Pelorino residents um, and how they're using their history to legitimize their right to stay in their homes and the right to stay in their communities. Um, my uh, second issue is uh, about uh, UNESCO, which uh, I know is sort of the overarching thing that fits into this, even though it wasn't, uh, it wasn't directly related, at least in your talk as much. Um, but also UNESCO's responsibility in the displacement um, and how, uh, how the Brazilian people are able to work with such global initiatives and in their ways of sort of reclaiming the initiatives themselves and, and for their own benefit. Um, and I'd also like to know if the UNESCO cultural heritage site in Salvador da Bahia is particular to Salvador and to the, the state of Bahia or if it has, a, if, if this type of study is something that you could see in other places in Brazil. Um, and, uh, you know, in particular, I guess I'm thinking about the differences between Olinda and Pernambuco and, um, and Bahia, which to me, it, I mean, and, the, and you brought this up in your paper as well, but there's, there's a, a contestation that takes place between these two big states of the Northeast, and Bahia isn't incorporated into the Northeast until the 1970s, right? But within that, there's sort of a battle that takes place over who gets to be the Afro state. And Bahia wins, even though every, in Olinda and in Pernambuco, I mean, it's every bit as African as Bahia, right? In that sense, that there's, but it doesn't, it doesn't have the same claims that Bahia, that Salvador has. Um, and um, so I'm wondering if that, and, and, and I don't, uh, there isn't the same uh, tourism or the same publicity that goes to <coughs> Olinda that goes to Bahia. So I'm wondering if there's something very specific about your study that has to do with Bahia. Um, and also in that, I was also thinking about um, Candace Slater's work um, about the UNESCO's uh, geopark site in Araripe and Ceará, which is sort of the first um, UNESCO geopark in all of Latin America perhaps in all of the Americas, in fact. Um, and the, in, in that, um, just as a definition, geopark, uh, geo, 
parks are supposedly supposedly have three objectives within UNESCO to conserve a healthy environment, to educate earth sciences at large, and also to foster sustainable economic local development. And Candace Slater works with Literatura de Cordel, or a popular pamphlet poetry, and it, a big part of, of forming this initiative has been, this is not just about forming a park, it's about the people within it and their relationship to the narratives within the Literatura de Cordel. Um, and with that as well, she draws on a lot of the biblical narratives that are drawn into Literatura de Cordel to create this sort of UNESCO heritage or geopark site and how people are talking about nature in order to justify it as as a, a UNESCO, as a global um, geopark. Um, uh, so I guess um, I'm wondering also if this is part of, if this is a separate thing, separate phenomenon or part of sort of a rural urban divide in terms of perhaps new, either from experience of seeing how UNESCO cultural heritage sites have worked or the ways that at least what seems to be happening is that that rural people are becoming a part of the project itself and their voices are important in terms of how the site is designated in the first place. Um, and um, another another point that sort of fits into this um, in terms of sites within Bahia and um, that are not in the capital city but outside of that and one particular thing I was thinking about is in the is the town of Cachoeira in the Hikonkovo, in the tobacco growing regions. Um, and in recalling a, a trip that I made to Cachoeira, which is famous for its uh, its candomblé ceremonies and and things like that, um, and there also happens to be a cigar factory within the town itself. And um, we, I, I happened to be there with a couple of friends from Bahia, and we went and we were uh, watching, looking, going into the cigar factory where you walk in, and it's, it's like going in anywhere to uh, anywhere you are in Salvador da Bahia to eat uh, traditional Afro-Brazilian food or to watch the orishas performing or whatever. It's a performance in itself with uh, women rolling tobacco who are dressed in white gowns and turbans and very well uh, jeweled and presenting a version of history as well because clearly they're not a part of making the cigars that are going on and it's for tourism. And while I was there, I happened to have a, a, a busload of tourists pulled up that were part of an African-American tour group touring Rio and Bahia to understand uh, what was the, as sort of in a way, uh, a, a back to Africa tour movement that instead of going to Africa, well, we'll go to Bahia and to Rio to understand our own history, right? And so within this experience, the the Africa the 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 tour guide explains to the African American tourists, you know, that these are our sisters here, and you know, this is the history of Bahia and making the t in making cigars, and we need to you know chip in to help our sisters monetarily, right? And every, you know, the the women are performing and, and making the cigars is doing this, and uh, and. As an outsider to this experience, I happened to ask what was at both the tourists and the um, and the cigar makers what their experience was. So, for the the African American tourists that I talked to, who uh, one of them happened to be a teacher here in New York, she said, you know, this uh, people in Bahia actually get what race what racial struggle is about. This is what we came, this is what I came to Brazil to see. The people in Rio didn't really understand this. The, the tour bus left, and the women immediately rolled their eyes and said, ah, you know, for, for the tourists. We're doing this for the tourists. This is all a performance, right? Um, that there was no sort of solidarity there um, in, that, in, in understanding that they knew that they were doing this in order to make money, and they were, do, and they were performing their Afro-Brazilianness for a certain audience. And that is that this is a very long uh, <laughs> viaging, but <laughs> the essence of it is to say is, you know, how much of what 
the Palo Reno residents are doing is because of a, a, the tourist market and or in relation to the tourist market in identifying them as a part of Palo Reno and Salvador de Bahia. And how much do they understand that, it, that tourists from all over the world are coming there to see the Afro-Brazilian inhabitants of the city and also to see poverty? And that, that this is a part of the type of tourism that takes place in Bahia. People don't go there necessarily to see a cleaned up version of, of Afro-Brazilian culture, but they go to take pictures of, of poor children and, or to participate in, in uh, work as interns and in NGOs or do different things like that. So um, I guess that would be um, another, uh, another question sort of added to that of, um, and, and finally, um, because so much of it was about the, the uh, or some, a part of your paper was about the, the influence of the researcher themselves within the community and how the social scientists have been coming for so long into these communities. I'm wondering also about your own positionality as a researcher and and not by Ian, and how that, how you are in your research maintaining that sort of uh, view of what you're, of where you stand within that research process. So, on mm -hmm. that, I'll turn it over to the rest of you. For example, Jan French's work is about um, a peasant community in a rural region. And of course, northeastern Brazil is characterized by massive migration and by families who are spread across the whole country from the Amazon to Sao Paulo, and has been for hundreds of years. Um, nonetheless, people who are living in a peasant community in, in the countryside are, are typically presented as, and hence become figures, who are quite different from those who are living in a red light zone. Right? Uh, and the people in the red light zone the people with whom I'm working and the people with whom I'm talking are typically not those people who are performing for tourists. They are, in fact, the mass, the great mass of people who were excluded because they can't perform correctly for tourists. And so it's this practice of culling, this culling of the, those who don't belong, and to a certain extent their unintended re-education through the culling process that interests me most. So. It's difficult for me, I mean, when I think of, for example, similar bits of work. So there's a lot of great work on indigenous communities in the Americas who create their own archives, for example, and write their own histories. Frank Solomon, Joanne Rappaport, right? But you look at a, a, a closed corporate community is very different from a red light zone, right? And so these are people, um, so a, a large group of people with whom I worked, after they were identified, they were transvestite prostitutes and they used their money to go to Italy to work on the streets of Rome. Um, I think that when you, so I think that these are people who, this is perhaps one reason that the Pellerino, you might contrast the Pellerino to an Olinda, because the Pellerino, given the sort of demographics and historical processes that I've just begun to touch on in responding to you, the Pellerino is a place where the everyday actions of people conform to the idea of malandraging in a way that becomes a sort of such a powerful cliche that it needs to be represented in a, in, in, in a variety of ways. And because it's such a powerful cliche, I would think it, in, in, to a certain extent, overpowers the sorts of historical narratives where, so for example, in, 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 I mean, I know Jan fairly well, and I know that the, the community that she works in, I mean, lots of social scientists have worked there and lots of social scientists have gone there in search of quilombos. And the people have become very good at, in fact, enunciating a history, so half of the community became very good at enunciating the sort of history that would allow them to become quilombos. Mm -hmm. But the story that I'm telling is really quite different. It's not, the, it's not, the, it's not a, a story of people who are saying, oh, you know, in fact, yes, our ancestors were here for 200 years and, and I, can, I can trace it back. And it's not that we're simply mixed race peasants. We are, in fact, Afro rooted Afro Brazilians, hence we get our land, which is the story of Quilombos. It's people who are sort of saying, 
I don't care about history, and I don't participate in history, but I carry around notebooks that allow me to participate in a, a, a very, very different universe of subjects and objects and past and present and future that I personally can't really get a hold on given the social theory that I know. So a subject is not a subject, an object is not an object. And yet somehow they're empowered and somehow they have agency by doing this. And I would say that this is, you're, you're misrecognizing and this is a fetishization, but, the, but it, yet it works for them, right? And it becomes incredibly, it becomes incredibly sort of this, this, this play of mirrors and that then all of a sudden there is this claim to a rooted very specific moment in the past. And at times it might be put forth in relation to the busload of tourists who are coming, so it's very easy, easy to, to, to write off, right? Um, I, I actually think that, I actually think that w one of the things that, that's, that's happening here is that the moment of my research was the moment of transition. So you have people who are not prepared for or accustomed to the types of narratives that are imposed upon Quilombo communities and who are not the sorts of subject that are amenable to them. Right. They're, they're disruptive subjects. They produce other sorts of, of, uh, of discourses. And I think that, you know, if I were to go back, uh, you know, this is from when I do write when I was, is, is, to, is, to, is to follow up, because I haven't followed up in the last three or four years. So I just said to you that, for example, one man who, who, who was climbing up a ladder in this rune is now a geography student at the Federal University of Bahia. And the fascinating thing is, is that he was uh, an incredibly strong practicing Pentecostal Right? Everything was Jesus. Everything was Jesus. Everything was Jesus. And there's this moment now where social theory is replacing Jesus for him. Um, and of course, this is, this is a, a sub-argument a, a sub, sub in, in, in my paper, which is the relationship between Christianity and Hegel. Right? Uh, but you might, you, you, you might actually see a sort of, sort of, this is a punctive moment at which people are creating all sorts of histories that don't conform to the types of histories that we think are correct. That the that people who that, that, that a large number of these people who are being incorporated perhaps are now. Um, Olodum is a, uh, uh, is a is a counterpoint. Well, I won't go into Olodum. Let me, let me see if I I'll continue. Those were there's an incredible number of things that I could talk to for for an hour, but I've already talked too long. So perhaps we should open it up to everybody.